there's kind of more to be said than we could say um, about your generosity for the Daily Cal, um, both with the building that we're commemorating and dedicating today, but also just over the last few years. So just know that all of us student staff at the Daily Cal um, understand all that you've put toward the Daily Cal over the last couple of years, and that there's really no amount of things that we can say um, that would equal what you've done for us. So I guess as a small of gratitude, we do have this book for you. <laughs> really delighted to be here today in this place dedicated to a free press on this day commemorating the 50th anniversary of Berkeley's free speech movement. So I think everybody here would agree that these days, and especially in the wake of certain Supreme Court decisions, when, <laughs> when big money speaks with a deafening voice, that we need to do all we can to amplify the words of independent journalists. Daily Cal reporters have made autonomy and student leadership the cornerstones of their vision of their consistently award-winning paper. And our Graduate School of Journalism has, is, is home, home to the renowned investigative reporting program. It is one of the world's most vibrant, collaborative, and prestigious training grounds for journalists in the world. So I'm tremendously excited to be here today in this place and to see you guys working side by side, disseminating news, views, and the truth in the Center for Independent Journalism. And if Mario Savio were here today, he might say, I hope you have fun <laughs> taking the megaphone back from the proverbial machine. <laughs> so. We are really thrilled to be here to, tonight with this distinguished panel. And this is something that we want to do more of at the Daily Cal, is that we want to have more um, events like this that bring people in the community together, um, uh, bring people together with prominent journalists um, in the community to, to talk about the issues of the day. And there, um, uh, there couldn't be a nicer place to do it and a greater community to do it in that and Berkeley, where we've got uh, plenty of interesting folks. So, so as you began to look into um, uh, the FBI's looking at subversives, uh, uh, w w what surprised you? Uh, or did anything? Uh, uh, well, actually, there were many surprises. Um, I got involved in this project originally through the Daily California. I was a staff writer there in the late 70s or 80s. Actually, overlap a little bit with the uh, uh, At that time, we were in 2490 Channing Way, just off Telegraph, and I remember you were lucky if you could find a typewriter with all the keys to uh, bang out your story on half sheets of paper, which would get marked up in an hour. Cast iron device with uh, keys or something. Uh, well, one day I had a call from my editor at the Daily Cal. And he asked me if I would be interested in taking a look at some FBI files that the paper had gotten under the Freedom of Information Act. The Daily Cal had made a FOIA request in the mid-70s, um, inspired partly by Watergate and partly by the sensational hearings being held by Senator Frank Church, uh, which became known as the Church Committee hearings, and were the most extensive, uh, and still are the most extensive, uh, examination of domestic surveillance activities this country's ever had. So the church committee revealed all kinds of crazy intelligence activities, uh, young witty dosing of, of citizens with LSD, army surveillance on citizens, uh, CIA plots to assassinate people, uh, J. Edgar Hoover's dirty tricks, which were known as COINTELPRO, going on at various places in the Daily Cal decided to find out what had the FBI been up to at Berkeley, which after all was an epicenter of protests during the 60s, uh, and perhaps the, the scene of the earliest and largest uh, sustained student protests of that period. An argument could be made in many ways that the 60s began on this campus. Um, so the Daily Cal made this Freedom of Information Act request, and it took many years for some files to finally trickle in. Then I got this call one night. 
who's been pushing a hand truck of FBI files across the campus in my apartment, eager to find out what had the FBI been up to here at Berkeley. And uh, I went through those files and wrote several stories for Daily Cal focusing on <coughs> FBI spying on the free speech movement and on the Vietnam Day Committee, an anti-war group which followed. I was struck by the volume of files that the FBI gathered about the university. Now that was just a small portion of it. I submitted another Freedom of Information Act request, uh, much more extensive, and sent it off. And it led to a long legal fight, uh, five lawsuits over a 30-year period, and ultimately 300,000 pages uh, plus were released about the University of California system. And I was just astonished to answer your question, uh, by the extent of the FBI's intrusion into not only campus protests, but the university administration. And these records document that the FBI had infiltrated student organizations, professors, the ranks of professors, the administration, and even the border regions where the FBI had uh, connections to certain regions and worked with them to try and fire Clark for the president of the university. One of the things that inspired me to dig into this early on was a memo in which um, was a report about a protest uh, involving some students. And Hoover had a practice of writing on memos. In fact, he would annotate memos and then give them back to his, his assistants. And that's one of the ways he actually managed the FBI. He would just make these notations and then these consequences will happen. Uh, so he wrote on this memo, I know Kurt is no good. And I was absolutely intrigued to know why was the head of the nation's largest law enforcement organization saying that the leader of the nation's leading public university was no good. So those are, uh, then I went to Clark Curry and gave me permission to get his files. Mario Savio gave me permission to get his files. And then the picture started to come together. Uh, these documents established that the FBI, uh, Berkeley was the scene of the most extensive FBI counterintelligence activities on any campus, any campus community that we know of. And it, it really is, um, ultimately a cautionary tale about the dangers that uh, secrecy and unbridled power pose to freedom of, uh, of speech and freedom of thought. And Rick, so, so do you think that, um, I can just project here, um, do you think that the fact that you were filing these FOIA requests from a student newspaper, do you think that the, the, the FBI or, or the, any government group it took it less seriously because it was a student newspaper? No, no, I, I think that they took it very seriously, especially once lawyers got involved um, on the act of it. Uh, at, you know, the Daily Cal is in a unique position to report on a very important institution, the University of California State Organization. And the archives show that the Daily Cal really had the best and most comprehensive reporting about the campus and the community. And, the and in your book, you go, you, 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 the reporting, the original reporting on the FSM was obviously before your time. You go back and found a lot of important things in our, our, our files. Absolutely. Yeah. And an incredible historical record. You know, created by students, uh, volunteer reporters, and editors of the Daily uh, and, and Martin's got his own COINTELPRO uh, story, which I'm going to go to but, uh, in just a minute. But first, I want to go to, to Lowell, who uh, was investigated himself by the COINTELPRO. Uh, 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 can you tell us that story, Paul? Well, well, first of all, I mean, COINTELPRO was not an investigative arm. It was a counterintelligence operation designed to neutralize or interfere with the activities of the people who were targeted. I don't want to give it a good name for calling it investigative. Right? Right. 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 So, so it neutralizing. It was actually, a, like, actually technically, it was a file that uh, the FBI offices had, and they were proposed to headquarters actions that would stop people from doing activities that the Bureau thought were not in the interest of the government of the United States, in their view. And so newspapers, and that's what I was, uh, was involved in, newspaper down in San Diego uh, in 1968, 69, 
70, uh, and it came up here a couple of times, but newspapers were targeted in particular uh, for uh, activities that would in some way disrupt their operations. We weren't exactly a large profit-making organization, for instance. So they would figure out ways uh, to stop us from distributing newspapers. They would support the San Diego police department's subversive squad to come in and arrest our landlord for murder. Um, and, and charge him to hold him overnight to try to convince him to evict us. There were, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different, what we would call uh, internal domestic warfare activities that were going on at that time. And the same thing was happening here in Berkeley, in Oakland, and around the country. Um, I think interestingly enough, though, that when the church committee hearings that, that Seth was talking about, which are really extraordinary, because you haven't looked, I know there's a whole set of bankrupt library. Uh, if, if no hearings like that have ever been held in any country in the world other than the United States. And, it, and they reveal all kinds of activities, not only COINTELPRO, but other activities of the government domestically, as the success was talking about. And so it's a cautionary tale, I think, about what's going on today. Basically, uh, I know this sounds a little funny, but the FBI was not really a law enforcement organization at the time that Seth was monitoring what they were doing. They were primarily involved in intelligence gathering, information gathering, disruption of what they thought was subversive activities inside the United States, and then also counter espionage. The law enforcement side of it was primarily focused at that time on things like auto theft, kidnapping, uh, various things that would get them to press. So they, they really were not, in, in the sense that we think of them as a federal law enforcement agency, that you can get rewarded in the FBI if you were involved on the criminal division side, it was the intelligence side, and the intelligence side. We, in 1996, uh, 97, in part because of the church committee hearings, the FBI did an internal <coughs> information. So from a news gathering point of view, for instance, before 1976, I didn't have many sources in the FBI. They weren't doing the kind of thing that I was interested in, political corruption, organized crime, uh, corporate crime. In 1976 and 77, they changed. The priorities of the Justice Department changed in the manual of the Justice Department as a result of all the things that didn't happen. That change has now changed again. And the FBI today is a domestic counterintelligence and intelligence gathering uh, operation. They are still doing some what I would call worthwhile law enforcement operations. I uh, just talked to a senior official there about their law enforcement operations, and he's complaining about their lack of funding because he's not into counterterrorism. He's not in counterintelligence. And so I think that the lesson of, of Seth's book and, and information like this uh, is that we have a whole new area of reporting to do about what is the FBI up to. They are on campus in a way that uh, they have been for a number of decades uh, that has more to do with counter espionage, foreign students, um, to a certain extent the justifiable worry that governments like China have sort of infiltrated universities across the country, but they are on campus, they won't deny it. They, uh, in fact, I believe that the president of the university is a member of the FBI's coordinating council on research universities in the United States. So you're saying there might be an FBI presence in the room uh, as we speak? No, they didn't. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, I can't tell, but I don't think <laughs> too many people have been worried about attacking, but I, I, I would say that there is a, uh, a re-emphasis, if you will, and we know from the NSA revelations and other things that are going on, on what are we doing, <coughs> what we're doing, uh, watching what we're doing, what we're saying, and so on. So it's becoming the same kind of issue again. Uh, Martin, you grew up in Berkeley, and uh, uh, when you work at the Oakland Tribune, um, you were talking the other day that you met, um, uh, and you went to Cuba and interviewed uh, a former East Bay Black Panther, Martin William Brint. Uh, and you, uh, so you, you flew to Cuba to interview him, and you have your own uh, to talk about uh, stories. Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting because I, I grew up in this town. I grew up in 19, I was born in 1968 when uh, many of these guys were already out doing uh, 
great work. And uh, but in the backdrop of my life in Berkeley, my parents kept me very politically active. And so when I came, the backdrop of my, of my childhood was you know, the tail of the civil rights movement, the free speech movement, uh, what was going on in the Vietnam War. And really seeing my parents very active, people coming over all the time, meetings, going on marches. I was yelling, hell no, we won't go before I do it again. <laughs> and, uh, because that's, that's, that was what was happening in, in, in my life. And it's interesting, it's incidentally, is that when you think about sort of every movement that has come up, has really come up from youth. Right? And, and that's where the energy, that's where the movement occurs. And, and it's interesting because right now we're sort of in this place where youth development is where the focus is, where philanthropic dollars are going to sort of adjust or correct uh, perhaps what's happened over these last few generations with young people. And what's not happening as much, and there's some youth organizing and activism that's happening within that framework, but it's not the same as it once was when we're talking about the movements that were happening when I was just a child. And so that it's, I think it's, it's a little unsettling because there are plenty of movement-worthy issues that ought to be emanating now from you. And I'm not saying that you are involved, all, but there certainly isn't the same kind of movement that was happening at that time. And you know, thinking about college funding and cost and the gap of uh, the, the rich to the poor, uh, global and climate change, there, there, are some, there are some movement-worthy issues. And I think that a lot of what's going on right now is uh, the, the focus on developing youth so that then they go into the world and perhaps change it through their good deeds. Rather, the generation that came before that, the generation of my parents and the speak in, was that you change the world or you effort to, and through those changes, perhaps you grow and become a more vibrant individual and contribute to society. So there's a real difference there. I think that's a challenge. Uh, my own experience, as you mentioned, with, with Colin Shell Pro came with going to Cuba as I'm a musician, and so I was going over there with my band and trying to make some money to record a live album of Report the Building Tribune. And I was like, well, that sounds like a great idea. I can record an album and I can talk to William Brent. I come back, I can write a story, I can see my senses. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so they didn't have cell phones at the time, and so I don't even know how I found this guy. Um, because once we got there, we thought he was available to talk to me. He had recently done his memoirs a long time gone. The book, a very interesting uh, book capturing this. And so I went over there and had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Brent. And for those who don't know, uh, Mr. Brent was, uh, <coughs> he's joined the Panthers very late. He's about 37 years old, he'd been in prison, uh, which also speaks to the fact that he was among the oldest of those who were involved at the time. Uh, he had uh, rose fairly quickly, uh, was ended up being able to be a bodyguard, and spoke and meeting with taking photos of him. At the Tribune, and actually were able to go with the story. And uh, he was involved in a, there was a robbery, there was a shootout in San Francisco. Two police officers were severely injured. He was arrested along with two accomplices. And he had already been in prison and vowed that he would never go back. Uh, he maintained his innocence. Uh, Elder Squeer, I think, expelled him from the party. I'm not sure what exactly was happening there, but clearly he was not pleased. So Mr. Brent said, well, I'm not going back to prison. So he got on the flight, 1969, flight 154 from TWA from Oakland International Airport on a flight bound to New York City with a 38 revolver and brought a snippet before he got on the plane, uh, which is a really interesting detail. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he told the flight attendant somewhere over in the valley that I was getting ready to hijack the plane. And uh, went into the cockpit, had a pistol in front of the, over the, uh, the flight of the pilot. And probably said, well, we're going to make a quick pit stop in Havana. And uh, he, said, he, told he, he, told, yeah, he told the passengers that. I don't know that one quote. <laughs> and, uh, and so when Brent landed in Cuba, I think he, he, he thought that he was probably going to be greeted a little more warmly than he was, but in fact, he was in prison for 22 months uh, because they thought he might have been a spot. I'm not sure. And uh, long and short of it is, he stayed there and never came back to the States because there was no. Uh, statue of limitations on the sky jacket for those of you thinking about it. <laughs> and, uh, and he married an American journalist there, uh, who I also had a chance to meet, Mr. McManus, who's also since passed. Uh, and he went to the University of Havana and did all these things. So by the time we got, we got back, we, uh, to go with the story, we got a hold of some of these documents about Cointel Pro. So 
contributed never really run any stories like that or did any never run any of those documents and we packaged those together. And so the scene in black and white, some of the memo, memos and set references about specific deliberate actions to subvert uh, and, and to infiltrate and undermine these organizations was really very powerful and disturbing for me and sort of confirmed uh, what my parents had already told me that you know you can't trust the government, they're bastards and uh, and all of that. And uh, and so what also was very telling, I got a chance to talk to Dave Hilliard, the former chief of staff, and Lane Brown and some other prominent candidates, and talking to them decades later, they were still incredibly impacted by the experience that they had gone through. Uh, the captain obviously been playing on their own, uh, so they were the party. But the fact that all of this had been going on and the impact of it and really concerted effort to undermine the organization still stuck with me. They were still very suspicious, still very and it hurt, impacted, and, uh, and, and it's something that stuck with them. And I, I was definitely thinking that. So in reading Seth's book, I read about Hoover's fixation in what he called the Black Hate Movement. Uh, spent very little time on the white hate movement and the KKK, and there was, uh, apparently the FBI did a little bit of uh, in investigating here. But these were, uh, you know, these were these were rough times, and um, uh, it was a, a very different time than today. And as I began to think about um, government, what form government spying might take in this um, NSA era, in this electronic era. Um, on a campus like, like Berkeley's where um, there's not the same kind of turmoil that there was during the FSM, and during the anti-war days, during the anti-apartheid days even. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different campus, it's a, it's a different world, but it's also a world that electronically is um, presumably much easier, especially if you're the FBI or the NSA, to engage in um, electronic <coughs> Um, everybody's uh, got the telephone in their pocket, and the young people, especially that also grandparents in the room, have Facebook accounts, and they're probably pretty easy to take a look at. So, um, what kind of spying do we think that the NSA is engaging in, um, and the FBI engaging in today, electronically, beyond the revelations of Snowden, uh, that they're that they have a bank. Uh, they know what telephone calls were made from the landline. It probably goes beyond that. Does anybody want to speak to what what might be going on in terms of um, government spying on social media? Yeah, I, I'll take a crack at that, but I want, I'd like to step back first and not put it in the historical context of the campus. Um, this October will be 50 years that the free speech movement happened. And, uh, <clears throat> As you may know, the free speech movement was a protest over whether students have the right to engage in constitutional activities on campus, the same activities that they could engage in if they were across the street. So in other words, handing out leaflets for the civil rights movement. It's not a hotel bro.
core to civil rights group, very middle of the road civil rights group. Well, no sooner had he set up that table than a campus police car pulled onto the, 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 the uh, lot. And two campus officers grabbed Weinberg and promptly went limp uh, using a, an old civil rights uh, technique, making the authorities work to, uh, to move him. They loaded him into the back of the car, but before they could drive off, students started to sit down around the car. Almost spontaneously, uh, this happened. Uh, it had not been planned. So students were sitting down around the car, and they started to chant, let him go, let him go. And this just grew and grew, as if a stone had been cast into a pond, just ripples and ripples, until finally the entire plaza, from the student union to the steps of Stroud Hall, were filled with students. And they held the car captive for 33 hours. And that's what started the free speech movement. Mario Savio was the first person to stand on top of the car and to uh, give an impassioned speech uh, calling for student rights. This set in motion a conflict that convulsed the university that made headlines across the country, that made Berkeley synonymous with student protest. Let me just her out. And I was a sophomore at the University of Wisconsin in the movement showed up two weeks later and we had a rally in Berkeley. I was in Wisconsin before Berkeley, so the ripples hit me when I was 19 years old. The FBI agents who were in the plaza that day were astonished to see these clean cut students. Students like Savio was wearing a, a sports coat and an Oxford shirt uh, to hold this, holding this police car captive. They, they never, in all their years of monitoring events on campus, they'd never seen anything like this. They sent back their memos, their reports to Hoover, who was just beside himself. Do you, do you think that the FBI came to campus after hearing about, they weren't just hanging about Sproul at that moment, but they, they came up to campus from Chad, and they had a little office down there, but as soon as they heard of it. Well, they were often in and around the campus because they were checking student records uh, at Sproul Hall. They were, Every week they would put thousands of student files and, and look at that other students. So this, this set in motion a special conflict and, and to uh, <coughs> summarize it a little bit, three leading figures emerge from this. Uh, Savio, a spokesman, not a spokesman, but a spokesman for the free speech movement. Clark Kerr, who was the president of the University of California, a staunch anti-communist Democrat, very centrist, um, was the man in the middle. And on the other side, a neophyte politician uh, named Ronald Reagan, who, who it turns out had a very long and close relationship with the FBI, went back to his days in Hollywood in the 40s when he became an FBI informer, reporting fellow actors and actresses. Well, you, this conflict between these three figures and the social forces that they represented uh, had tremendous implications for the country. And behind the scenes, the FBI was deeply involved. And so were other intelligence agencies like the NSA, the CIA, military intelligence agencies. One of the interesting things to come back around to your question, the kind of information they gathered in those days, it would be routine for FBI agents to gather student records, in those days, they were all papers, so they would have to come to Sprout Hall where the court would just give them carte blanche. They would go to banks, they would get financial records without a subpoena. All the phone records, every utility company had a security officer, part of whose job was to cooperate with FBI agents and just fork over information on suspected persons. Now today, this could all be done with a few clicks on a keyboard. And the NSA is, as you know, from the Snowden revelations, has gathered incredible volumes of information, not only on foreign adversaries, but on American citizens and their activities, their email, the contents of their email, all the attachments, whether they're medical records or financial records, as well as on uh, foreign governments, uh, whether they're friends or foes. What we don't know yet and what Congress has, in my opinion, failed to follow up and to inquire about is how that information was actually used. What did the NSA do with this information after it gathered? 
We know from the church committee hearings that back in the 60s and 70s, the NSA was doing pretty much the same thing, although only with the technology available at that time. So in those days, the NSA got all the telegrams from Western Union and, and gathered up all this information, all the telephone records, and provided it to what were called client agencies, like the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. And the church committee points out that at the same time that the FBI was involved in dirty tricks of the kind that, that Martin was talking about, and Walt was talking about, the kind that were going on on this campus to get Clark Kerr fired, to harass Mario Savio. At the very same time the FBI was doing that, the NSA was providing information uh, that it had gathered so Hoover could draw on that as well. So I think the questions that Congress needs to ask is, who, which client agencies got this information and how did they use it? Well, and so the cops aren't them and, and neither are the journalists. And that's why um, these days we do a news story. As soon as the <clears throat> crime is committed, as soon as we find somebody in the news, that reporters just start going to Google and going to the Facebook page. Cops start going to the Facebook page. And people will say, as we know, as the journalists know, probably readers of journalism know, um, you know, people will say absolutely ridiculous, divulge absolutely ridiculous things on their social media they will commit a crime and then they'll go write about it to their friends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but so the, the cops, this is some pretty easy pickings. Um, but but there, it, it, it's got to go deeper than that. Um, and we don't know very much about that. Mark and I were talking on the phone the other day and um, he said something very telling about the diminution of the number of reporters we have out there. One said that we don't cover the police anymore, we cover crime. So, um, you know, with, with smaller staffs at, at the regular mainstream media newspapers, um, there's, 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 there's cops reporters, is what we call them, but there's very little looking at the, at the big picture. Uh, yeah. And, and maybe I'm naive, but I still have a lot of faith in, in my colleagues in papers like the Washington Post and the New York Times and uh, in organizations like the AP that while they may have been staffed staff before, these kinds of stories about the NSA, the revelations of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and Edward Snowden, these are the kind of stories that I think journalists get up for. I think that these are the stories that news organizations get up for. When they run up against the wall, they want to they want to run against the wall and keep pushing. So I, while I understand that these institutions are clearly you know, hard to get into, hard to break through, and there's so much to figure out, there's one NSA, there's one FBI, there's, there's one Justice Department. A lot of my concern, frankly, lies around we live in nine counties, and we have a nine county mayor. And in those counties, there's 100 cities, according to the Association of Bay Area, of Bay Area Government. And in those, there's 100 police departments, probably close to nine county court divisions. Uh, police departments that have divisions within them, homicide, we cover homicide, we don't cover, cover the homicide division. There are sheriff's offices. So there's, and so for me, when I think about spying, and I'm not to minimize it, I'm a little more concerned about getting in the car and getting pulled over on my way back home than I am necessarily about the NSA looking at my emails where they're gonna find pictures of my kids and uh, other attachments related to work. I'm more concerned about the fact that we have records laws in the state of California that don't enable us to look deeply appropriately at uh, the uh, records of police officers who've been disciplined in personnel files, and that there are all these exemptions. So while we've got these concerns around these larger issues around government spying, we've got our own mini NSAs and institutions that we need to watch out for in our very counties, in the cities uh, that have greater probably an opportunity to impact our liberty on a day-to-day -day basis than perhaps uh, the NSA. So on the campus and, and what the protests were about. So it's an example of how Daily Cal played a critical role in getting information out to the public that otherwise was getting twisted around by some of the groups that established media. So I think you can never underestimate the role that, that the Daily Cal and other campus newspapers can play. But to come back to Richard Ailey, um, I'm not going to labor too much, but one of the things I reported in my book is that uh, a prominent radical activist named Richard Aoki, who um, 
He was active on campus. He was part of the Third World uh, Liberation Front, which was the movement for uh, opening ethnic studies up, establishing ethnic studies. He was also very close to Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. He had known them from Merritt College. And in interviewing a, uh, one other thing about that, he had also publicly boasted of having given the Black Panthers some of their first weapons and firearms training, something that Seal confirmed in his memoir, Seize the Time. Well, I, happened, I was doing research on this book several years earlier and was interviewing a former FBI agent, and we were just looking at old FBI files and newspaper clippings that were in the file, and we came across a photograph of a man with a black leather jacket and sunglasses holding a stick by a Saturday day. And this, this FBI agent said, hey, I, I know that guy. He was my informant. Wow, you know, what is he telling me? You know, so we talked more about this, and I did a lot more research about Richard Aoki. And then when Aoki passed away, 2009, I filed another Freedom of Information Act request about them, and then sued to get the records. And those records and other documents show that he had been an informant because the FBI had made an error in how they redacted him and had identified him through the use of this code language. It might not be immediately apparent, but they have symbol number sources that they assign to people. And this occurred in several places and I was able to quote it. So the FBI didn't want to release the records in this lawsuit. But the judge said because the FBI had inadvertently released his identity in these other records, they had to release more information. So it was by court order that the FBI released this information. And it was consistent with my other research. I was very skeptical about it, you know, very self-critical reporting it. <coughs> I have no doubt that it's accurate. Sorry. Could it be that he was a double agent? Well, that's another question. I mean, that's entirely possible. And he's gone now, and we won't know. He, he's probably not going to say that he was. Yes, yes, sir. Well, I, I would like the panel, if they would, to, to uh, comment their feelings about three things that concern me. One is the, the, the sort of diminished amount of resources that have devoted devoted to professional journalism, those <coughs> papers are contracted, combined with the concentration of, of professional journalism in small hands of, of corporate people who are running newspapers. And then the third thing is the, the uh, growing journalism that is unregulated, not professional journalism on the airwaves, the, the internet. And those three things. Well, I, I'll say for all the journalists up here, thank goodness that uh, journalism is unregulated in this country. I don't mean regulated. I didn't mean regulated in terms of government. I mean professional. Right, standards. right. That's but but all of us, we, we, we've, we've had a wonderful pretense all along in journalism in this country. Uh, uh, here's my press pass. Here's my card. There's no such thing in the First Amendment that, that guarantees us our press freedoms about um, having to own a printing press or anything like it. So it's all been a wonderful charade that we have created of the professionalism being the important part of journalism. So in, in, in that sense, we have to welcome the, the loud, raucous conversation of the blogs and, and everybody else. And we know it's not a, a God-given thing that to, to establish a newspaper or a television news or this organization or anything else. And everybody's a journalist. Nobody is. It's not a license like a doctor or a lawyer. So that's the good news. Um, and so is, as we've been you know, we're focused on student journalism here, is this, I, I really love hearing this. I mean, you know, Mark and I are trying to pr protect and, and defend the fact that you know, we don't know any, any spies or guys who are in, in bed with, uh, with government in our newsrooms. But the fact is, we are sort of establishment, whereas as Seth is saying, Student newspaper, ipso facto, is not establishment and was so key in reporting on um, you know, here in Berkeley and, and always will be because the young, young people haven't had a chance to be bought out there. Um, they're, 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 they're idealistic and they're running you know, a, a fantastic newspaper like 
like the Daily Cow on their own at a very young age. And they're it, and they're moving on and on, and, and because nobody's cynical, uh, or not very cynical. They get something quick. And it is. <laughs> <laughs> they're not too cynical at 19. That's no. my brief thought. Right. Down, and, down the line. Just very briefly, I want to say that I think that the concentration of corporate journalism uh, is not necessarily a good thing. I think that when you have fewer people controlling the institution, I think it's a problem. I don't think it's the, it does not benefit our industry. It does not benefit uh, our society. Uh, I think also there's a, a great issue with the changing demographics of the country, which are not at all reflected in the newsrooms across the nation. So we're losing. We're in, journalists. Journalists are now sort of legacy media is, is less in touch with the uh, constituency it is purports to serve than uh, in ever before, especially after the huge contraction of journalism in around 2008, 2009. And so while there's this great groundswell of grasp of new media, uh, of people getting involved in committing acts of journalism, I don't necessarily think that everyone, I kind of disagree with you, I do, I do think there's a difference between people who are telling stories and journalists. And, and that difference is, is that if you look at a news organization, we are accountable. Uh, my byline is on this. You call me. If I'm a blogger, if I'm doing something, if I'm writing a story and I'm not connected to an organization, the reputation of that organization is not connected to our levels of standards. So I'm saying, I'm not saying that that's not important or that, that those folks contributing to that narrative are not vital to it, because so much now is happening is bubbling up from those places because traditional media are not necessarily in touch with the communities that they're trying to serve. And so I think it's incredibly important that those, that those uh, voices are there. But I also think that there is a distinction between a news organization, a news outlet, and professional journalists, and that's your reputation, that's the reputation of your organization. That's quite well taken. And then Seth and, and Lowell, and then we're going we're gonna to cut it out and have a further conversation on the patio.